Hello and welcome to today's panel discussion on the proposed changes to the OpenType specification. I'm Marianna Paszkowska and I'm thrilled to be here today with you all, a fantastic group of experts and all of you in the audience, to dive deep into this exciting development. We will be moderating this panel together with Dave Crossland from Google. The proposed changes to the OpenType specification offer a significant advancement, allowing for more sophisticated advanced fonts that support a wider range of languages and writing systems. Today, we will explore the technical details of these proposed changes, their potential implications for the typography industry, and the challenges and opportunities they present. And before we dive into the discussion, uh, I'd like to remind you that panelists are only representing themselves or their personal views, not the views of the organizations they're associated with. Now, let's take a moment for our panelists to just very briefly introduce themselves. Hi everyone, I'm Dave Crossens, and I work with the Google Fonts team. And uh, I've uh, been uh, looking forward to seeing some advancements in the format to overcome some issues that we've encountered in some of our font commissions over the last six years. Hello, I'm uh, Behdad Asfabot. I work on mostly the Herfbuzz shaping engine and on the font tools Python library also. And I've been working with the Google Fonts team with the proposed changes today. Hi, my name is Simon Cousins. I'm a freelance font engineer, uh, specializing mainly in fonts with very complex layout requirements, minority scripts and things like that. Um, and because of that, I've been working for the past few years uh, with Google Fonts on the Noto project. Hello, I'm Georg Seifert and I'm the main, de developer, main developer of Glyphs app and font design app you might have heard of. Peter Constable, I work with Microsoft. I've been, uh, well, for many years, was part of the Windows engineering team, uh, most of the time working on text display and uh, font infrastructure. And I am now in a role primarily working on standards in uh, the area of, of type, uh, like the open type spec, and globalization. So I'm very involved in the Unicode consortium. Hi, I'm Adam Tfardo. I work with FontLab and I also um, often annoy people by um, giving them ideas or nasty questions about how to make uh, the OpenType font format better. So um, that's it. I am Tom Rickner. I'm the director of the studio at Monotype. <laughs> My name is Jos van Rossum. I uh, uh, work on the Font Tools uh, Python library project, and I've worked with uh, Black Foundry here in Paris for some suggestions uh, for the open type format to include variable components, and that has been continued by Bedat uh, as part of the proposals that he will talk about today. Hello, my name is Frank Rieshammer. I'm a typeface designer on the Adobe Type team. I'm John Hudson, a uh, type designer and um, Emmy award-winning complainer, and it turns out that compla <laughs> complaining gets you on the panels. Thank you. And now, Dave, could you please give us an overview of the boring expansion innovations? All right, I will. Okay, so uh, back in 2021, uh, Badad had presented uh, a vision he had for the future of uh, font formats. And since then, and recently, he's been experimenting with some of these ideas. Which uh, we'll now be presenting. So, uh, what's in a name? Uh, well, uh, we've called this uh, the, uh, the Better Engineered Font Formats Update Overall. And um, the idea of engineering here is uh, not only um, you know, the uh, sort of technical engineering, but also trying to skillfully arrange things to, um, to arise uh, uh, in, in this deliberate way. And so um, we have a kind of intention to modify the form format uh, in, and add some things which have not been done before, 
uh, instead of a more conservative or incremental approach that has been happening previously. And so uh, today for the panel, we have these uh, three parts to present with uh, some discussion points. And so the boring expansion part um, is uh, the first part I'm going to talk about. Then we'll have a discussion. And then I'll present uh, uh, the next pieces, parts two and three, and we'll have another discussion. Now, I do want to uh, acknowledge uh, that the uh, lineup of our panel here is uh, not as diverse as uh, it uh, maybe ought to be. And this is a missed opportunity. Uh, this uh, image here is from Iran. Um, there's a women-led movement there at the moment. And uh, I would like to see more diversity uh, involved in these discussions. And we'll return to this point at the end. So into part one. Um, this uh, is boring uh, expansion of the font format. And uh, we're calling it that because we're discussing these relatively more incremental improvements. And so um, we're looking at how things have accumulated over the decades in the format. And there are some somewhat kind of tedious pieces uh, you know, to, um, to stretch out, to expand. And rather than starting from scratch, that incremental progress, I think, is a good way forwards. So um, we want to overcome these, uh, these limitations to um, maintain the existing design. And um, yet, in, in, it's despite that, to do things which may not be backwards compatible. And the consequence of that is that it can take a long time for these uh, kinds of changes to roll out and to uh, you know, become widely available for the user community. And if we had started on this maybe uh, you know, six years ago, maybe we'd already be in a good position. But that's, so there's no reason to delay. Let's start now, I think. So there are four major pieces to these kinds of boring expansions. And the first thing is uh, the AVAR2 table, which has been discussed a little bit in some presentations already. Uh, it was presented in detail at the last ATIPI uh, Tech Talks event. And it's a new version of the existing AVAR table that allows us to do uh, different kinds of mapping of axes. And Badad and others have been working to implement examples of this in font tools, in half buzz, in free type, um, in SAMHSA on the web. And uh, Apple have uh, shipped an implementation already in the Mac OS. And so the use cases for this design space axis mapping is to warp the space. This allows us to do the higher order interpolation, which Underwear have been presenting. Um, it allows us to slim down the parametric fonts, which Font Bureau have been developing. And it allows us to uh, do uh, what Font Bureau call fencing the design space to add sort of edges to the space to make it safe so that you can't get to undesirable areas. So the way that it works is to um, remap the axes as functions of uh, input axes. And um, the way that it's worked before is this sort of one-to-one -one mapping. And with AVAR2, you can make these adjustments across the axes. So you can have the user input a value for weight and for width, optical size and grade. And those could map to just three underlying axes. Uh, with, with Hoy in the same way, the user inputs one value, but it maps to several axes. And with the parametric axes fonts, you have those user axes mapping to many axes. The fencing idea is not new. Uh, there's this very famous uh, diagram of the universe family and you can see that there are areas of that grid that are empty. So that's really what the fencing means, to make those undesirable areas not accessible. And in prototyping this, we're seeing some remarkable file size savings. So in those parametric axes examples, where you have a lot of axes that do one thing, and they all get combined to create those different weights and widths and so on, we see that the data to make those weights and widths is not there, and thus you see a very large file size saving. OK, on to the second piece, glyph outlines. So the glyph table has uh, quadratic beziers uh, traditionally for decades now, and um, adding cubic beziers I think is desirable. Again, we have demos, um, and uh, this is you know, allowing 
slightly smaller file sizes, slightly higher quality, as there's no conversion, many type designers do draw with cubics and not with quadratics. So there's some implementation details here. There's a flag in the simple glyph outline, uh, which can imply the qubit Bezier's off-curve points. We also have implied on-curve points, which is an important detail for interpolation, and the fundamentals of hinting and unaffected. And so, yeah, there's this small file size savings. The third thing is to uh, take, you know, what the glyph app is called smart components and bring that into the format. Um, this idea of having variable composites is uh, something that's been around for a very long time and is in other font formats outside of the world of OpenType. So um, this has been based on some uh, proposals by Black Foundry and Yusuf Van Rossum, uh, who developed that kind of uh, what they call deep components for um, one of their projects. The way that classic components from TrueType work with variations is that, in fact, the translation offset works, but the other kinds of transformations are uh, not available. And so with variable components, the proposal brings those back so that all of those different kinds of uh, transformations are possible and that the composite can be referencing variations through the design space. So again, there's lots of use cases for this. East Asian fonts, uh, lots of, worlds, of the world's writing systems can benefit from this. And even the Latin writing system with an ASCII glyph set, you could uh, see a lot of benefits of this from stencil designs, icon fonts. So to make this visual, you see here that um, we have a row of green shapes at the top, uh, which would be the design space masters. And then those can be interpolated to create all of these different kinds of uh, outputs. And so it's variation within a glyph rather than variation of the whole style. And again, the file size savings from the uh, prototype explorations of this has been very significant. And so, um, especially for East Asian uh, writing systems, there is a lot of um, highly geometric forms, um, you know, composed forms, uh, where things are similar in construction, but not the same. And so this kind of slight variation in the components creates a lot of reuse. Uh, so uh, the fourth piece is the beyond 64K. And as some may know, there's been a long-standing limit in the font format that you can only have 65,535 glyphs. It seems like a lot. But as we continue to make progress uh, in supporting more and more of the world's languages and digital systems, it's becoming something of a limitation. And so uh, in the Noto project um, and uh, uh, the Source Hand CJK uh, project with Adobe, those fonts were released when they first came out at that limit. Uh, I think there was just maybe 30 slots that were reserved for future use, things like new errors um, in Japan. And um, there is many more CJK characters in Unicode that are not supported by those fonts. There's also a little bit of a dream to have one font to rule them all, to be able to take all the Noto Sans fonts and put them all into one file. And this can be useful in certain cases. It would be a very large file, but it would simplify document fallback um, in uh, document editors like uh, yeah, well, document editors. And um, that. Uh, there's an upcoming uh, incremental transfer technology for web fonts, uh, which would handle one single large file very efficiently. So the way that this works is to use a 24-bit glyph indices instead of a 16-bit one, and that will allow for 16 million glyphs, which should be enough. <laughs> we'll see. And so um, Unicode has around a million code points so far, and um, only 150,000 have been assigned in the standard. Um, and the reality is that Noto um, only has maybe 200,000 glyphs total. There are many glyphs, as you know, which have um, letter forms which are not ca specified characters. Um, this is a very intensive change, maybe the least boring from some point of view, uh, and it goes deep into the rest of the file format. 
Um, but there are uh, some interesting things in prototyping that have been discovered around alleviating the long-standing offset overflow issues that some of you may be familiar with. And um, the result of our prototyping is that Noto SANS can be made. It's 15 megabytes, not so big these days when you have movie files and lots of other large files around. And the work that's been done um, uh, on the GPOS table aspect is also, I think, very promising with the GPOS table over one and a half megabytes, yet without any overflows. A catch to this is that the improvements needed in HalfBuzz to make this work are quite a lot of code in the binary. So it grown, it's the binary of the HalfBuzz library is grown by around 10%, 100 kilobytes. And while we're talking about a 15 megabyte file, um, that 100 kilobytes can be significant in the system software. And I think there's more to do in this kind of uh, boring phase. Um, so there's other kinds of uh, you know, uh, things to do, native variations for Hoi, uh, maybe more compact ways of storing data. Um, maybe there's additional things we could do in OpenType layout itself, and things we can do to clean up the specification text um, things like uh, variable justification for the specification to go beyond the format and talk about how to use data. So an example of this, the justification variable access tag could be registered in the open type spec and it could be used to, in a uh, sort of document interchange compatible way, allow for things like Arabic kashidas or other kinds of stretching or um, the kind of micro typography that has been famously implemented in the PDF tech system. So this is still something that's kind of, you know, uh, being explored. Um, unlike the other four things, we don't have such concrete, clear um, demos for it. Um, but the font with the supply, you know, an axis with a JSTF uh, tag. And then there could be various kinds of justification things done in that. And the typesetting engine would, you know, find the right way to use it. And so here is a quick demo of this. So you can see certain glyphs are being stretched to, uh, you know, provide a full justification. Uh, this is a modification of the rock text font by Harlid Hosni. All right, so uh, that brings us to the uh, end of, uh, of our part one here. So we have a little time for some discussion. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dave. And um, I'd like to kick off the discussion with a question to Baghdad. What was the driving force behind the conception of the boring expansion? And in what ways does it effectively tackle the pressing issues faced by the font design industry today? Is the mic working? Okay, yes. Thanks, Mariana. Uh, so, uh, one thing that, let me start this way. When I started working on font technology, I wanted to make Persian work in computers, and in particular, Persian and the Arabic script work properly in computers. And uh, by the time that I was contributing to the Chrome and Android code bases via Harfbuzz and working on the Noto project uh, at Google, I realized that we control from the font production and the font design and the font up to the delivery to the device and rendering it, except for the font format itself. And more and more it became the case that the font format became the limiting factor of what we can do at Express. So that's why I have shifted my focus. Uh, I'm not at Google anymore, but working with Google team, uh, shifted my focus to improve the font format to be more expressive of what we want to achieve. Now, in the boring part of the proposal, you see what I can, exp I can describe as more business justifiable changes. Uh, you see a lot of big file-sized saving features, like the 70% file size reduction in CJK is a big deal. Uh, 
So I try to bring something that is easy to sell uh, to the business people while solving a need that the designers have. Uh, same thing with the Beyond 64K. The CJK problem is a big uh, problem for designers in East Asia, but with solving that, we can also solve the problem of delivery of the one mega fund uh, to the world. So I try to approach problems that uh, I can sell as a business opportunity while addressing uh, develop or designer problems. That was my certain criteria for this part. Thank you. And um, well, it appears to me that the proposed updates are intended to function as a compre comprehensive package. Uh, I, I really like that with each proposal working in tandem to counterbalance any potential drawbacks of, of uh, the others, right? Uh, so you, um, I heard for the grapevine that you might have some intriguing additional insights to share about this, about you know, handling, for example, uh, the um, um, the Beyond 64K proposal, right, extends the file size, so it will be possible to have the pan Unicode fonts, right? Uh, so, but I heard that there are some extra enhancements uh, coming as well. Um, there's a lot more coming. This is just what I've been able to do so far. Uh, but you're right, it's a push and pull. Like, on the one hand, we are making bigger funds, but to to be able to afford that, we work hard to reduce the font size by something like, as I said, 70%. And then as John will talk about, there's the um, in incremental font transfer technology. So between the beyond 64K and uh, uh, variable composites and uh, in, in the incremental fund transfer, those three together fully solve the CJK web serving problem. And that's something that we have been trying to solve for at least 15 years. So yes, it's a, all of this go together and uh, like the incremental fund transfer, we started working on that five years ago and it's still ongoing. So these things take a lot of, take a long time. Yeah. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, and with the next question, I'd like to open the floor to the rest of our uh, panelists. Um, so I'm curious if you've come across any projects where the challenges seemed uh, insurmountable with the, without the aid of AVAR2. Um, and if you cannot tell us about specific project, maybe we can envision such a scenario and um, you know, uh, answer to what kind of type design conundrums uh, can be solved by the AVAR2 update. Uh, I wouldn't say insurmountable, but definitely it would make it easier to do some things we've been asked to do lately, particularly the, the, the ring fencing. Uh, we've had people that, that wanted to use Helvetica now, but they wanted a custom version, they wanted some things changed, they wanted a smaller set, a uh, smaller range, and part of that is just simply removing uh, masters, removing entire axis, um, but sometimes uh, uh, customers actually wanted us to, uh, to, to limit the ability to slide between things. And if you can really warp the space in the way I think you're going to be able to here, uh, you could basically have sort of detents and, and, and uh, only provide the statics in a variable. So now you've got a variable font that behaves like a static for all those people you don't want to give the control. And these are brand managers. They, they love the idea of variable to save size, but they don't want people playing around and doing something just 10% heavier or lighter than their brand standard. So this, this is, makes that possible, it makes it easier. Absolutely, anyone else wants to speak up, speak to this? I, th I think design space fencing is one of the most obvious uh, things that many normal font designers who don't do 64,000 uh, glyph fonts are, might be interested in. But I also see some challenges in the UI, for example, it, looking at the univari example that was on screen, what happens if you're in one of the corners of the design space where you cannot go anywhere else? It's a UI problem. Are your sliders suddenly vanishing? Do you only have one slider that can, can go in only one direction? 
So while this technical change might be very interesting on paper, it creates a whole new paradigm of UI problems that need to be solved. Anyone wants to speak to that? In terms of the UI, I mean, I think yeah. you know, seven years after OpenType variable fonts were announced, we still don't really have UI for variable fonts. Um, you know, we, <laughs> we haven't proceeded any, anywhere beyond the idea of sliders. Um, and the number of sliders will only increase as the complexity of the kind of designs that, that are going to be possible with AVAR2. Um, I haven't had projects that you know, I couldn't do because of the absence of AVAR2, but I've certainly thought of projects that I can do if we get it. Um, you know, things that would be difficult to do with AVAR1, um, as well as it's, it's useful to think of AVAR2 also in terms of a design tool, uh, that if you're dealing with extrapolation between axes into corners of the design space, and you're getting bad results. Well, if you could move that corner somewhere else, you might get a better result and find that you don't need to put an extra master in there, go to a lot of extra work, because you can shape the design space to your intentions. Sliders and pricing models. Two unsolved problems of variable fonts. That issue that you just raised is one that my colleague, uh, Rob McCoy, raised um, so, in fact, this is an issue, this is an area that we have already been uh, working on for seven years because the whole, the um, BEDAD's uh, design proposal for AVAR2 is a refinement of a proposal that I wrote in April of 2016 uh, for what we called XFAR at the time. And it arose because Rob was saying, there are probably gonna be cases where the different axes of my font are not really independent. And as I get into a certain corner, I'm gonna be adding masters to try to control the interaction of the data in those corners. If we could have some way of warping the design space, then that could help reduce the amount of additional data to be added. Um, so having uh, you know, had a, my own part in this particular idea, I'm definitely supportive of it. Um, I wanna thank Bedad for uh, the contribution he's made, because I think there's been uh, two very important contributions. One is that he, he's been able to show applications of AVAR2 that we hadn't originally seen. I think that's one very important advantage. And then uh, the second one was right on the tip of my head and now I'm forgetting. Um, what was the second thing I was gonna say? Um, there were two things for me, or two. There, oh, just the fact that the idea of warping a design space and what does that actually mean, it was conceptually really hard to understand what would the implications of that be. And in fact, um, some of the people here were part of a discussion at A Type I in Montreal in 2018 about how could we proceed. And in this like one hour plus meeting, there was a lot of confusion in the room about what, does, what are we trying to do and how would it actually work and what would the implications be for user interfaces. And so, um, but that's made a really valuable contribution in starting to prototype something because that was something that has been needed all along. Let's actually investigate and explore what is this doing and what results will it actually provide. If I go back to my colleague, Rob McCoin, and, I've, and he and I have started to discuss this proposal, he again has said, okay, this, this is going to help in some things, but I'm, uh, he, he's saying that the design may need actually to have even more flexibility. In particular, he's suspecting that what we will really want is the ability to morph the design space differently for different subsets of glyphs. 
And uh, so that's something that I think we may want to explore before we settle on a single design. Thank you. And then to speak to that also, um, Avar to allow um, easier implementations of higher order interpolation designs, right? So what are some real life use cases uh, in, variable f uh, that, in variable funds that um, you know, uh, use higher order interpolation and offer a considerable edge, edge over traditional linear interpolation techniques? So anyone wants to speak to that? Um, so the uh, the really cool implementations of of uh, higher order interpolation we have seen in in several talks from from underwear who kind of made 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 a lot of public made this whole technique um, uh, aware for the public but I think there are a lot of small uh, small uh, things that like very useful cases of uh, that you can use is like simply turning something yeah. you have a Whatever, like you, like very commonly have in in a in a website or in an app, you have a have a button and you click it and a plus button and it gives you a user interface and it turns around to become an X, and to have have that in a font to turn turn something is super complicated with variable fonts, mm -hmm. and having like a viral with higher order interpolation is super easy and also like these smaller like there is some technical details about adjustments how how th things get thicker but it's uh, but I think these kind of this is a good example, like just turning something and then making that is useful. So that's really, really interesting because we saw in the past very um, eye candy, expressive use cases of that, but it's, it can be even, um, you know, un invisible in the UI when you design font, right? To this, this extra refinement, um, that's, that's really impressive. Um, there's even uh, there's even like a, like a very, very common case, and that's basically probably people who you know, the designed variable or even multiple master fonts know the problem of kinks. So effectively, where you have diagonal parts that are, you know, longer or shorter and have different angles, and then they all line up in one master, they all line up in another master, but due to the fact how linear interpolation works, in the middle you have, like, the one point that is traveling differently, and that is... Um, has been just like a really tedious uh, way. Sometimes it's it's really hard to solve and you have to like re-engineer the entire glyph to get rid of it. And here the idea is that, you know, this high order interpolation could be applied to even just single points. So let's say you have like one point here, one point there, and they just interpolate linearly. But then in the middle, you just define a movement that isn't a straight line that is just slightly curved so that actually, you know, you get this uh, straight line in the end. And that's, that's just, uh, you know, that's something that is, would be then completely invisible in the final font because it wouldn't be fancy, it would be just bug-free, it would be kink-free. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, speaking about font editing and, and AVAR tools, what are some ways that they could be seamlessly incorporated in the UI that is convenient for the end, for the, for the user, for the designer? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is something that is, is with this, with speaking about all these new formats, there is always something that is in the, um, in the processing of the files and actually using the fonts, which is mostly what beta is concerned with and solving most of that really beautifully. And then we have, like, um, uh, um, Adam and me have to figure out how to then make that accessible to, to, for the user to control. But, we do, like, this is, uh, we, um, uh, it's not something we, we have finished yet. So this is work in development. And so I think we come up with something on some point, but, um, yeah. Thank you, Garrick, and uh, I would like to hear from you. Yeah, th th that is indeed not something I also, I do not have a, a vision for that as well, but I'm just saying, wanted to say it's now existing as a proposal in the file format, which is step one, and Lawrence Penny has been working for to describe this in a design space file, so now that is what we're still talking about, that how it should be written in the design space file. Once we've figured that out, I think then we can kind of think what kind of graphical UI goes on top or something. I mean, that's, that's kind of the step-by-step -step, uh, things, how, how, how I 
see these things to develop. Excellent point. And I might just say that because it actually, you know, applies to pretty much, it's mostly interesting for multi-axis fonts. I know that from experience, people who uh, just have the imagination to design like in three axes, uh, even if the original implementation in a font editor would be just some kind of a text specification where you just write this, those people will handle it because like really this is not like uh, like having a clickable GUI versus a text representation when you're doing a three axis font I think I think actually I know that some of the people for FontLab uh, who use FontLab they said yeah yeah I like this GUI but actually just give me a way to write this in text because this is what I can control and you know I know the numbers already, or I've figured it out. I just don't want to control so many points. So yeah, but certainly this is a work in progress. Yeah. Brian? I'm curious, even for a very single design space, if we think of an extra light interpolating to an extra heavy, we always have the problem that the middle of the design space gets muddy. And many designers opt to add a whole new source design or master design in the middle. As far as I understand, this could also be abstracted away via AVAR2, where we st would still draw in a font editor like Fontra, uh, but then this master wouldn't actually exist. It's, this is a question. I think also similarly for, for the common cases that Adam was talking about, where you need points that, that move along a curve, in a way, you can just tell your font editor that you want the cut points to move along this curve, and there doesn't need to be any kind of complex UI across that. When I think back to the original uh, true type variations fonts, you know, where this all came from, uh, the idea at the time was, was not to draw these corners and to interpolate like multiple masters, but to draw the regular, draw the thing that you use the most first and build off of that, like spiders. And, um, and this is where AVAR2 can help us actually realize that dream because now you can draw a, a weight with an optical size axis with only four masters. You draw the regular, you draw the condensed, you draw the bold, you draw the small or the large, whichever is different. And from those three things, you can get everything and then you use the AVAR2 to, to wrap and ring fence around the stuff that doesn't work well. So Mike Reed's dream back in 1991 can come true. Okay, uh, so let's move on to the second part of the, oh yeah. Before we jump on. This was characterized as the boring expansion. And, um, you know, as I think about what is in these proposals and what is involved in the implementation of these proposals, some of it is more boring and less boring. Um, so. When I think about AVAR2, a nice thing about it is that, for the most part, the implementation is encapsulated inside a rasterizer. That is the part of the code that is looking at, uh, well, looking at the axes values that come in as input and then deriving what are all the deltas that get applied to all the things that are varying. But in all of these, a question that I'll ask is, what happens when you print? What happens when you save your document to PDF? And then things start to not be quite as simple. So thinking about, um, thinking about the uh, smart components, variable components, which I, back in 2016, we started talking about that. It was an obvious opportunity to bring significant value. Uh, but if you think about, well, what would the implications be in the entire ecosystem? Are you going to end up with, or, or take uh, cubic uh, outlines, right? Are you going to end up in scenarios where I've got cubic outlines in this TTF file, but now I'm, exp I'm sending data out to a printer. And now at print time, some software that I, as the font designer, have no control over, that software is going to be converting my cubic outlines into quadratics. 
Is that a scenario that I'm enthusiastic about as a font designer? Maybe, maybe not. Um, several of these things involve these other implications as you look at the entire ecosystem. And that's why there's a lot of careful thought that needs to be put into how will we actually go about um, specifying and thinking through the entire ecosystem. This was something in 2016 when we worked on the first round of variable fonts. We took time to say, is there a solution for this scenario, for the printing scenarios? And it may not have been a perfect solution, but at least it was something viable for all of the, the different vendors to think through. Different companies that are going to need to implement things have got different things that are table stakes for them. If I'm a company that is primarily interested in web fonts for supporting uh, uh, cloud services, then I'm, I may be entirely happy to say, I can have as much data as I need sitting on my servers, and I can massage it however I need to before I send it out over the wire. Once it's gone out on the wire, I'm happy, right? If you're a vendor who is selling uh, you know, desktop graphic design applications, desktop publishing for uh, customers that are needing to support all kinds of print scenarios, your whole set of concerns is very different. And we need to think about what are the implications for the entire ecosystem. I have one more question, which was not dis discussed at all in the slides, but uh, Tom's remark about the regular being the most important style of any font made me think of it. One main problem we currently have with variable fonts is that we need to specify one default location in the variable font. And in a typical design space, this is the light condensed, or this is the, the narrow style, or something that's very undesirable. Many people opt to say, okay, I'm going to add a source in the middle of my design space just so I can specify this as my regular style. This is, of course, increasing the file size. What we would really need is a way to flag a style, to be the representative style of the whole family, rather than always relying on a corner of the design space. Right. Um, I... Uh we really Something need to, to that. Okay. I, I, right. I was just. I mean, La last could, remarks. Okay. The, the 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 default position could be anywhere in design space. It doesn't need to be at a source, right? Is that something that Avar uh, works on? Um? All right. Yeah. I know we can speak for uh, hours, but that yes. Okay, so part of the OpenType 1.8 design was that at the default location, no variations are processed. But with AVAR2, we can change that. We can allow AVAR2 to, to move the default. So you can have a font that only has two masters at the extremes, but the default viewable is as regular. That's something that I like to consider for AVAR2, yes. Okay, so that is not yet part of the current design, it's not but it's something... that way, but okay. that's something that I like to consider, yeah. yes. That would be very useful, I think, for many people. Thank you, and uh, it seems we are not that behind the schedule as we thought. <laughs> so all good. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. Let's let's move on to the second part where we also will have a surprise expert guest uh, dialing in. All right. So uh, we um, uh, let's see here. Uh, so um, uh, the part two here is very quick. And uh, we're just going to take a bit of a detour to talk about this for a minute. And um, then we're going to uh, move on to part three. So uh, part two is uh, a better ergonomics. And so um, you know, ergonomics is a study of people's efficiency in their working environment. And so um, uh, part of this work on the font format, experimenting it with practical implementations um, is uh, been happening in the context of efforts to rewrite all of the common free software, Libra software around font uh, for, uh, data in uh, Rust, uh, either from you know uh, common software in Python or written in C, C++. Um, this can help us 
reduce the number of security vulnerabilities which users are exposed to. And a, a practical uh, effort recently is to uh, make a font compiler super fast. And uh, when developing a compiler, the compiler has what's called an internal representation of the format data, uh, which it then can output in various different ways. And so having a very fast compiler um, and having uh, you know, software that's been written fresh uh, is a good platform, a good uh, leverage point to inform new font uh, formats, uh, both in the binary side and potentially on the source side. So uh, with part two out of the way, uh, we're going to uh, take something a little bit out of this world. Um, and so um, uh, we're going to talk about the um, beyond emulation piece. And, and um, to set the stage for this, uh, we're going to have a special guest dialing in, uh, Sharon Carell uh, from SIL. And so she's uh, dialed into the Zoom. And uh, we're going to have her up uh, on the screen here. Hi, Sharon. Hi, can you hear me? Very well. Thank you. Uh, Graphite is a smart font system developed by SIL International. We started development around 1999, so it sort of grew up alongside OpenType. And our motivation was that we needed a system that would work for the lesser known languages around the world, ones whose orthographies had not gone through a standardization process. So they might use special characters not in Unicode or unusual combinations of characters, or maybe even an entire script that was not in Unicode. And OpenType is not a good solution because it only works well for standardized script data. This is because it uses a higher level engine to drive the rendering process. And that engine needs to understand the basic rules of each script. For instance, it needs to build in the idea of contextual shaping used in Arabic and the vowel sign reordering for index scripts like Demonagri. Now today, Unicode is much more mature. And so the open type engines are much more mature, and there are very few scripts that can't be handled adequately. One of these is Lana or Northern Thai. There are issues in, oops, should I start over? Oh, no. Ah, sorry. Can I start over? Uh, sure, you can definitely start over, no problem. <laughs> I should have just gone on, but whatever. Okay. Sorry. I, I think, I think to... they, can, they can edit it a little bit. So, so I know, but I, I'll I just think... start over. Okay. I just forgot to hit next one, so I'm like, I'm not on the right slide. Anyway, I should have just done no it. No problem, no problem. Okay, so um, I'll start again. So, yeah. hey, Sharon, so thanks for joining. And uh, yeah, please take it away with your presentation about Graphite. Well, thanks a lot. Um, Graphite is a smart font system developed by SIL International. We started development around 1999. So it sort of grew up alongside OpenType. And our motivation was that we needed a system that would work for the lesser known languages around the world, one whose orthographies had not gone through a standardization process. So they might use special characters not in Unicode or unusual combination of characters, or maybe even an entire script that was not in Unicode. Now, OpenType is not a good solution because it only works well for standardized script data. And this is because it uses a higher level engine to drive the rendering process. And that engine needs to understand the basic rules of each script. For instance, it needs to build in the idea of contextual shaping used in Arabic and the vowel sign reordering for index scripts like Deb and Agri, things like that. Now today, Unicode is much more mature. And so the open type engines are much more mature. And there are very few scripts that can't be handled adequately. One of these is Lana or Northern Pi there are some issues in HarfBuzz that the industry doesn't seem motivated to address. And even when they get it fixed, it takes a while to propagate the changes throughout the open type engines. Um, there's numbers of these. So we'll need Graphite for a while during that transition. Another major script is Nostalik style Arabic. The calligraphic style of Nostalik has complexities that are difficult to deal with in open type and become intractable when you start trying to handle multiple languages in Pakistan and other countries, languages other than Urdu. So along the way, we added some smarts to Graphite to handle the collision fixing um, and the spacing and kerning issues that we ran into uh, when we were working with Nostalik. Graphite's architecture is different from OpenType 
in that all the knowledge about behavior is encoded in the font, including the basic script behavior. The disadvantage of this, of course, is that, for instance, every Arabic font needs to include basic rules of Arabic shaping. Same with Devanagari or Burmese or whatever. For many scripts, this is not a large overhead, but there are a few, like Devanagari, where it is significant. The advantage of graphite is that you don't need an existing driver with knowledge of the script, and, and you can define the behavior to be anything you need it to be, which is what you might need for orthographies that aren't standardized. Another advantage is that you only have one engine, so you can expect much more consistent behavior than we often see from open type fonts. Graphite uses a rule-based programming language called GDL, or Graphite Description Language, similar to Fee, but it's more powerful. And we've also created a development environment with a debugger that's really helpful. The main disadvantage of Graphite is the limited application support. It is available in SIL's own linguistic and publishing tools, and also Firefox and LibreOffice and things based on HarfBuzz. But there's no support in popular software like MS Office or Word, InDesign, or Chrome. Uh, we've also seen that the inconsistency of the OpenType engines has a real development cost, and so Graphite's single engine approach is a big benefit. Also, even for situations where OpenType is adequate, Graphite can be useful for initial development due to the power of the language and the tools. Now, as I mentioned, one of the really challenging scripts that we've developed a font for is Nastalik style Arabic. We needed to support not just Urdu, but 25 languages of Pakistan, which represent 125 million speakers. And Nastalik's also used some in Afghanistan and Iran, and that's another 40 languages. Because Nastalik is so difficult to render using font technology, most fonts are carefully hand tweaked to handle Urdu well. And that's, that's difficult, but feasible when you're talking about just one language. But most of these fonts don't work well at all for the remaining languages. Hand tweaking a font for 25 languages is just not a feasible development process for various reasons. Many of these languages use extra characters. Often they use more nuktas that cause collisions, or they may use more diacritics than Urdu. So what makes Nostalix so difficult? It's a combination of factors. It has a sloping baseline, which creates horizontal crowding, and it's very calligraphic, so it requires a large number of glyph forms. For instance, our, our font has 50 forms for each basic letter shape. And the slope, together with the number, the large number of possible glyphs, makes it hard to predict where the collisions will occur. This graphic shows the difference between Nostalik style on the top and the same text written in the standard Nasc style, which is flat. And you can see how crowded Nostali can get. And here we see a number of words that include the sequence Ray, Pei. Ray is colored red and Pei is blue. And you can see that some of the sequences are fine, A and B, or like C, they're, it's, almost, it's almost fine. <laughs> but for the ones on the bottom, they definitely need some kerning to fix the collisions. Because of the diagonal slope, it would take an enormous amount of context to um, to write rules to handle all the necessary cases. Another issue is that properly written Nostalik allows the di diagonal segments to overlap slightly on the vertical axis. Here we see some Nostalik text where the top uses the standard spacing and the bottom shows what it would look like with slight overlaps between the segments. And the bottom is more authentic looking Nostalik. So instead of writing a gazillion rules to handle every possible collision, the ideal way to fix them as is, uh, is, well, the ideal way to fix them is at runtime, when we know exactly what sequence of glyphs we have. And this is what we added to graphite. Our mechanism has two aspects. We can fix um, collisions by shifting nuktas and diacritics. And there's also a kerning feature that can fix collisions, but is also used to improve spacing, including allowing the diagonal segment overlap behavior that we just saw on the previous slide. And all this happens at runtime. The font we developed that uses this is called Awami Nostalik. And because of this collision fixing capability, it can support a wide variety of languages in Pakistan. And here you see uh, examples of, few, of a few of, the, of these languages. For those of you who are familiar with Arabic, you'll notice that the highlighted characters are rather unusual. They're not used for Urdu, and so they're often not supported in other fonts. 
the arrows, so places where runtime kerning has occurred, either to fix a collision or to create more authentic looking spacing. So I hope this gives you an idea of the, of the complexity of NOSTA League and more generally the power of graphite and why we're enthusiastic about the possibility of it maybe or maybe some equivalent capability being supported by a wider range of technology and applications. Uh, as uh, Badad had mentioned in the Q&A, um, his experiences as a young person, um, you know, motivated him into this area. And so um, with OpenType Layout, we uh, have been exploring, you know, Badad has been exploring going beyond emulation. And so um, back, if we could go back to the slides now. Um, the OpenType Layout system you know, has a fixed nature. It's a sort of, um, you know, data approach to things. It's not using um, computation. It's not using programmability in the fonts. And so when thinking about shaping in the abstract, it has more of a fluid nature. And that is something which computation in the font could address. Uh, Graphite has been showing that. And so Open type model, the open type shaping model is one of many. And so here we have this tree illustration. You can imagine open type shaping is one leaf, graphite is another, and there can be many more. So um, these complex script issues uh, uh, that Sharon has been showing, you know, are many. Um, and a key aspect is this idea of needing to know things at runtime you sometimes are not able to provide data in the open type model because you don't have the data to put into the font. It needs to be computed. And so um, we uh, have uh, an interesting proposal from Badad that many systems today ship what's called the web assembly runtime. And um, this is something that we can utilize to enhance, to extend uh, the open type shaping model. Um, and uh, really, you know, the key aspect of WebAssembly is that it is a secure environment. A lot of investment has been made by a lot of companies in making the web a secure platform. And um, this idea to allow, uh, you know, that runtime to be used to compute things in the font at runtime is a very powerful idea. So um, uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Simon, uh, who's going to take us through how this works and some demos. Sure. The, the, what we're doing with the, uh, the WASM Shaper, as we're calling it, is uh, to allow you to place custom code inside the font, which controls the shaping behavior. And there are a few ways that we can do that. You can have complete control yourself and place all of the, the glyphs where you want them. You can uh, invoke uh, the existing open type rules and then kind of build on them and tweak them, um, which is what you're seeing here. Um, we start, try to run the open type rules shaped with OT, then we do our own things, and then we hand back to, to HalfBuzz to finish it off. Um, what you could do here is instead of this, pull in graphite uh, and run graphite in its entirety. Um, and uh, that was one of the first things that we did. Bedad got uh, the existing graphite engine compiled as a WebAssembly kind of package and put that into the font. One of the downsides of graphite is that it requires software on the user end. So graphite fonts work really, really well if you have graphite installed on your computer, in Microsoft Word, everywhere else. Uh, but most people don't. Um, but if we can put that engine inside the font, anywhere that supports the WASM shaper will support graphite. Um, it increases the size of the font a little bit. Um, it's a little bit slower, although we're working on that. Uh, but you can then have the power of graphite anywhere you go. Um, what else could we do with this thing? Well, we talked about the, the Nastalik problem. 
Um, and, and just to sort of recap that, uh, if you start with just the open type rules that you get from your font editor, cursive positioning, mark placement, you get the result on the left. This is using Notonastalik Arabic. Um, and the way that Nastalik uh, um, uh, open type fonts generally work is to kind of evaluate every possible sequence of characters and have special rules for that. Um, and as Sharon explained, once you get into uh, a larger variety of languages, a larger variety of glyphs, those rules just kind of become exponentially larger and it becomes unmanageable. This is the, the best effort we have in the middle, Nota Nasalik, um, with open type rules. And again, this, this has got this predefined set of rules. In this situation, this is what you do. Uh, it's okay, uh, but you lose some of the things that, that would be ideal. You lose those horizontal overlaps that Sharon talks about. In this uh, example on the right, we've taken Nota Nasalik Urdu, and we have basically taught it a little bit about how to do Nastalik. Now, this is just for the purposes of example, I should say. I haven't sat down with kind of a Nastalik calligrapher and said, you know, what are the actual rules? But these uh, dots and these glyphs are being kerned by the WASM engine. It is working out how far away things should be. It's working out where the dots should be so that it can avoid the collisions itself. What else can we do with this? Well, sticking with Arabic for a moment, this is a, um, uh, a font RF Ruka by Khaled Hosni. And in the Ruka script uh, style, what should happen is that the middle of each run of text should be balanced on the baseline. And again, this is a computation problem because you have to say, well, how long and how high is my block of text? Where is the middle of it? And how do I shift that down how many units to get it sitting on the baseline? And again, when we have WASM, we can make it do that computation for us. So we take the ordinary open type rules, and then we just say, find the middle of each run of text and shift it down so that it sits nicely on the baseline. Notice also in this, you've got uh, on the bottom example, the, the meme. And the alif are kerned a little bit tighter. Again, this is using that automated kerning uh, that we can do through this. Something that we, we simply can't do at all at the moment is uh, handling uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, we have a Noto uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics font, but it doesn't handle layout at all. And the reason for this is that the model of encoding layout in Egyptian hieroglyphics is completely unlike any other system in Unicode. Um, it's based on the idea of subdivisions of the M square. So you have an M square, and then the first character says, right, now split it in half horizontally. Or in this case, split it in half vertically. Uh, on the top, put this. On the bottom, split it into, into quadrants. Um, put the duck in the bottom left quadrant. And in the top right quadrant, split that again and split that again. Um, so it's incredibly complicated. It's incredibly complicated even just to pass the, the instructions to lay this out. Um, Andrew Glass at Microsoft has managed to write a parser and a layout engine for Egyptian hieroglyphics in OpenType rules alone. But it's, it's not the most manageable and it's not the most maintainable of things. Uh, the, the, the layout that you're seeing there is uh, Noto Sans Egyptian hieroglyphs being laid out using the WASM shaper. So this is a real example of what it would look like. Um, it's not just for uh, minority language systems. Uh, another problem uh, that this can help us with is stuff like um, handwriting fonts. Um, so when you have a handwriting font, um, and let's say you want to create a dotted handwriting font, what you would really love to do is treat the, each block of words, each run of words, again, as a single stroke joined together. Because otherwise, if you treat it as individual glyphs, you can put a dot at the start of one glyph and a dot at the, the, or, you know, dot at the end of one glyph and a dot at the start of the next glyph, and they'll overlap. Uh, what we can do with the WASM shaper is have those dots placed automatically. We can change the size of the dots and it will recompute where they need to go. 
Again, this is something that can only be done if you're treating it like that. We can have a little bit more fun with this. There's an idea that Adam came up with of uh, how about if we have a pixel font that isn't really a pixel font. Uh, what it is doing is there is a font underneath and we work out where the pixels ought to go at runtime. So we can change the slant, we can change the weight, we can change the cursive, but also we can decide how many pixels there ought to be at runtime. These are some of the fun things that we can do with a Wasm shaping engine. Okay, thank you, Simon. So, um, some of those uh, demos uh, start to explore, you know, why we would want to do this. And um, this is uh, not so boring. Um, so, we've showed, you know, at the beginning this idea that you could take the entire graphite system and you can put it in here. And there are other kinds of shaping solutions around in the world. Obviously, the uh, Decotype ACE is uh, well known. Um, and uh, the digital cart system as well uh, has been presented at uh, you know, public conferences. Um, but Dad has told me of uh, you know, other solutions that are only available in Iran or Pakistan. And a key point here is that there isn't one standardized solution. There's, uh, you know, having a general runtime is something which allows everyone to come up with their own systems and so I think that is a, a very powerful thing. There's, um, uh, you know, uh, additional things I think that may be possible when the font itself can have computer programs inside it, that those programs can couple to the typesetting engine and, um, you know, as Badal has written here, finally put the smart into fonts. So, um, there are some precedents for this idea of, you know, having open programmable systems in the graphics world, in the web world, um, yeah, in, in typesetting systems themselves. And um, this opens up something of a philosophical debate. Um, the open type engine, you know, has been developed over many years and um, it's, uh, you know, been developed and improved incrementally very far. And so um, the sort of, you know, the next step may have to be a radical one to go beyond this idea of a, a sort of more of a declarative system uh, to something with full computation. Now, that being said, something else that Badad has uh, explored and demonstrated in recent years is that the open type lookout system, in fact, is Turing complete. It's very tedious to work with, but it is possible to get computations out of the open type layout system, um, uh, and um, nevertheless, having a sort of modern, uh, you know, web assembly programming environment um, is uh, going to be very powerful, productive, and as the demos assignment has showed, all of that has come together in really just a few weeks. And so um, I think that shows the power of having a, you know, contemporary uh, powerful system. And uh, the um, final point here is about the file size again, that there is the uh, potential since OpenType is uh, running um, first and then the half buzz WASM shaper runs at the end, the possibility is to just do a tiny little bit in WebAssembly code and continue to use the existing OpenType system. So that's been our uh, three pieces here. And um, in terms of uh, what to uh, do next, there are three um, you know, forums, I think, where these discussions should continue. So um, the work that has been happening has uh, been happening on public uh, GitHub forums with public code. Um, there's forums like this event and other type events to discuss this. And then there are more formal uh, sort of standards bodies, um, such as the MPEG Open Font Format um, Ad Hoc Group, which is an open uh, group for discussion. And um, MPEG is part of the International Standards Organization. It has a very formal system of country delegates and um, uh, is, is something that people can uh, you know, join up to um, to participate at that level. And um, uh, before we... Uh, uh, yeah, so let's, let's uh, 
have uh, some discussion here. If we can have a quick comments from some panelists. Uh, and then um, uh, we're going to open it up to the floor. Let's, let's hear from uh, John Hudson. Um, Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> what am I thinking? Slides. Oh. Um, so this isn't uh, specific to kind of future open type two ideas. Um, this is a technology that is kind of in develop media de development now. Um, will be kind of arriving uh, within the next couple of years, I think. <clears throat> We've been working on it for about five years. Um, and so I, if you're dealing with web fonts, and particularly if you're licensing web fonts to customers, uh, you might get customers coming to you in the next couple of years asking you about this technology, asking you if they're allowed to use it with your fonts. Um, so now is a good time to start thinking about it, um, particularly thinking about it in terms of licensing. Um, so this is a... Um, it's an initiative of the uh, W3C Web Fonts Working Group. Um, there's, uh, it's currently at what they call working draft stage. Um, there's a link there, and if you want to use a QR code, it'll take you directly to it, uh, the current draft. Um, basically, the way it works is that font sits on a server, and instead of the entire font being sent when a website uh, calls, you know, calls for it using the uh, at font face in CSS, uh, only those glyphs and the necessary data with them for open type layout, for kerning, et cetera, um, that are required to display the page get sent. Um, and then if the content on the page um, changes, uh, what is sent is a patch. So any additional glyphs, any additional kerning open type layout information, et cetera, gets sent along and gets patched on the end, including any interactions with the glyphs that were there in the initial uh, delivery or in subsequent patches. Um, obviously, you can see this has a primary benefit um, for CJK, and that was you know, one of the driving um, uh, um, targets behind the development was, uh, you know, if you've got a, a font that contains anywhere between seven and 25,000 characters or something like the note of CJK fonts that reach all the way up to the current open type limits, um, you don't want to be sending that entire font uh, for a page and might be using you know, 400 characters. And so um, this obviously has a, a primary uh, benefit to that. Also, any other large multi-script fonts, um, if Google do decide they want to build the one giant Noto font, um, this is a technology that's going to be needed alongside some other technologies uh, in order um, to make that a viable and useful thing. Um, there's diminishing benefits. So if you're a foundry that is just developing Latin fonts, particularly if you're just you know, mostly focused on European uh, character sets, um, you're not going to get a big benefit out of this, and there may not be a you know, benefit in terms of uh, size or speed um, to using it. On the other hand, if you're someone who is concerned about entire fonts being sent off, um, you might see a benefit in something that's only actually serving portions of fonts that are needed to display the content. Um, so, th things to think about in licensing. Um, uh, if you've got a web font license that you've got at the moment, uh, look into this technology, understand this technology, and consider adding some specific language um, about IFT so that your customers know whether they can use the fonts with IFT, um, under what restrictions might apply. Um, obviously, if it's sending parts of a font and sending patches to a font, it's subsetting. So if your web font license says no subsetting allowed, you know, obviously that's not going to work with this technology. So that's something to think about. Um, your web font license might make a distinction or not between hosted and served. And this is particularly important um, if you have restrictions on what formats to use. So a lot of web font licenses say you, know, you can only use WAF2 or WAF files. Um, and What's interesting about this technology is that because what it's, what it's serving is not WAF or WAF2. It's serving um, 
the, the fragments of fonts are broadly compressed, and broadly compression is part of WAF2, um, but this is not actually WAF2. So if, if you've got a web, a web font license that says you have to serve WAF2, um, that's not going to work with this technology. So you're going to want to look at the technology and come up with some specific language. Um, um, John, if I, if I may, maybe let's invite everyone to learn more about that online and um, let's start with the discussion. If Maybe just like... A, yeah, um, I'll leave that up there. The rest of it's sort of fairly obvious. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so a, a lot of uh, new knowledge, I can imagine for everyone, a lot of uh, exciting, uh, fascinating updates. But um, I think one of the most important questions for the moment we are now uh, is that as these updates are adopted, uh, what potential fragmentation issues could arise? So how can the type community work together to ensure successful adoption and development? preventing fragmentation within the tap industry ecosystem. Who wants to speak to it? Dave? Do, uh... I just, I'd just like to say I, I'd love it if some major software developers would first support what exi exists today in the standard. I'd like to see kerning in certain applications that all my customers use. <laughs> just... It works. It... You just need the Kern table, the old one. It works. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to, say, to directly address this. I think this is, you know, this, especially the WASM shaping component is kind of like a, there is a bit of this chicken and egg thing where, yes, it's a new thing. But on the other hand, I think, you know, we as a community, we've been, uh, shipping and pushing these incremental improvements like okay here's universal shaping engine and then a few years later there's like open type svg and then there's a uh, variable and then there's extra variable and stuff and every time we do this so the open type uh, spec changes uh, all the people the companies like google apple microsoft etc they need to get their engineers in different products to either implement this or not and every time it's like oh yeah we need to get like one of our top engineers for three more weeks to do this delta so i think the idea with the wasm shaper which is uh brilliant that you know we can kind of propose to these people who implement is like yes there is this one more thing but then you know all the other stuff will be done by the developers you you won't be bothered we won't bother you in a, a year or something oh yeah we forgot this one thing so please you know update this so that's the i think the idea of and of course i just wanted to say well the one of the other existing examples of executive programming language in the fonts has been actually the true type hinting instructing language the problem with it uh, was that it was very domain specific. So you had to specifically learn that language and there were very, very few experts who could do this. But with the WASM, the example that Simon showed is actually, you can write in Rust, but you can actually also currently, you know, write in different uh, programming language. You could even embed a complete Python interpreter and have the code in Python. Yes, it's possible. You could, have a transpiler for most stuff you can run in python and get chat gpt to translate this into rust it works you know you you're open as a developer to use so many other resources that are out there because these are general computing standards wasm is general computing standard so any benefits in speed ups will benefit from as well and rust is a general you know, there are libraries, there's samples, everything. So it's it's much easier to do this because we can rely on the wisdom of, well, other people and large language models. Thank you. Uh, can I have a PostScript interpreter there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. Of course. Well, the, the, the demo that uh, Simon showed with the Pixel font, it actually embeds FreeType, the FreeType interpreter, which is ported into WASM, inside the table so you have a rasterizer inside the font that is emitting these pixels and these are then positioned as components it's 
It's brilliant. <laughs> so, in terms of outlines, this has, I mean, you mentioned true type instructions, I mentioned Postscript because Postscript type 3 was pretty much literally that, except for the shaping part. I don't think a font would have influence over the shaping. So, um, type 3 was at some point ruled out because of it, the free computation. And I don't think Postscript could hack your network or send emails. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm, I'm wondering what the thoughts, uh, I mean, WASM, of course, is, is secure. Um, and I bet if there's an infinite loop, uh, it will be cancelled somehow. What kind of implications does that have for a, a font? What kind of bad stuff can a font now do? <laughs> so security, like, let's... let's uh, I'd actually like to move beyond the security question because, I mean, it's the obvious question. And as was mentioned, people have worked on trying to make the WASM interpreter engine secure, right? Um, I appreciate Adam because of his enthusiasm. And I can predict that out of all of these proposals, uh, when actual runtime engineers uh, were to look at these proposals, the WASM thing is the one that will probably hit the most resistance. If I think about um, how do I implement hint testing with this kind of data in the font, the, the font has uh, computational data that could do anything. And the layout engine, uh, be it, uh, you know, Word or whatever that is trying to uh, actually provide an editing experience, really has no information mm -hmm. as to what is going on, what are the glyph sequences, what are the attributions on, those, on each of the glyphs, in order for it to determine when a user clicks on the screen, what is the glyph and the corresponding character code or codes that yes, goes that, with that, that, that's that a valid, position. Th those are valid concerns. Uh, maybe let's hear from Bedat and Simon. Uh, well, uh, if I could yeah, finish, course, okay. Um, I find it a little bit ironic that uh, Google is suggesting this because it's an idea that is most amenable to browsers that already have a WASM implementation and it requires new code for anything that isn't a browser. And this was exactly the point that Simon made a few minutes ago about uh, one of the downsides of Graphite is it works, but only in the places that currently have a Graphite runtime. This would be asking for all kinds of things to get new code. Whatever we do, you're still faced with that, with that issue. On the issue of you know, how do you implement um, you know, a hit testing um, algorithms, you need some kind of API. And that means that there needs to be some, uh, something structured about the data that a general runtime engine is able to derive from the data. At which point I would ask, how is that providing anything more than what we already have either in AAT or in Graphite? Why invent something entirely new when we've already got technologies that have been around for quite some time? The one question I would ask about graphite is, how do you inter integrate variations into that? I thank you. So uh, to look back uh, to the security issue, there, there was a lot to unpack. And uh, yeah, let's keep our answers uh, concise because we are uh, over time. And I would really love to hear some questions from the audience as well. But better. Uh, we got in trouble. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, uh, so let's uh, let's wrap up. Thank you. Yeah. One last statement. I I got close. So uh, thank you to our panelists and audience for, for an engaging and informative discussion on the proposed extensions to the open type specification. Well, it's clear that these updates offer a wide range of benefits for the typography and design industries, including greater, greater flexibility, efficiency, and support for a wider range of languages and writing systems. 
Um, ultimately, the proposed extensions to the open type font spec have the potential to promote inclusivity, cultural diversity, creative expression and economic opportunities in typography and design industries. By enabling designers and developers to create more versatile and adaptable fonts, these updates uh, can contribute to that. But this can happen uh, benefiting users across the globe only if we work uh, together. So thank you very much for, for particip participating and um, yeah, <laughs> see you around. <laughs>